Happy Friday. <laughs> yeah. So, so I just threw my, and you look so gorgeous, all spread out in your beautiful masks. Um, as I was walking up, I, I told Pastor Greg, I said, you know, being here with you, watching you worship and seeing our worship leaders here, it's like oxygen. So just so you know, like you're my oxygen, keep it coming. There we go. Well, today for our nation is a day of remembrance. Some of you may have, for those who get up early enough to actually see news before you go to breakfast or have class, it's 9-11. I was thinking this morning as I was watching some of the remembrances for this day that uh, some of you weren't yet born or may have been such tiny tots that you don't actually remember the day. But I remember my father talking and my grandparents talking about 9-11. And I mean, not 9-11, um, Pearl Harbor. Interesting thing is, at moments like that, you can ask anyone who's old enough to remember, and we can tell you exactly where we were when the news hit. And so today we remember, as a grateful nation, those who lost their lives, those who willingly, willingly rushed into danger to save lives. I hadn't really thought about that when weeks ago I was thinking about this chapel and preparing this address. It never ceases to amaze me how the songs that are chosen kind of line up. And it's like, how did you guys know? what I was going to talk about this morning. I'm going to talk about sailing on some rough seas. You know, there are times and seasons when it seems like we are navigating really treacherous waters. Times like this pandemic, for those of us who remember that time, not just 9-11, but the days and months and years that followed. Times of civil and political unrest, the yet-to-be-reconciliation for racial justice and unity, natural and man-made disasters. Many of you are watching the fires that are raging from California all the way up to Washington State. In such seasons, in such moments, there are also shining examples of navigating the storms of life well. Of course, our greatest source of inspiration is always found in scripture, but I also love stories across history that inspire and remind us that God is still calming storms, or at least calming us in the middle of storms. One such story is actually told in the book, or retold in the book, The Finest Hours, the true story of the US Coast Guard's most daring sea rescue by Michael Tugis and Casey Sherman. It was made actually into a film in 2016. Maybe some of you saw it. It is a great watch. It remains the largest open sea rescue involving a small boat in US maritime history. What is amazing about this rescue story is that it was done by a small crew of only four young men. If you remember our opening chapel, I talked about those young men who were actually university students and young women who were part of the Dutch underground resistance during World War II and say, you know, sometimes the greatest heroes that we know are the ones sitting next to us that are still university students. That was this case. These four young men, the oldest who led the mission was only 24 years old. The others were in their early 20s. The youngest was just 20 years old. The rescue took place in February 1952 in the North Atlantic near Cape Cod. The area between Chatham and Provincetown is known as the graveyard of the North Atlantic with over 3,500 shipwrecks that have occurred in that space. And it was in the midst of one of those devastating winter storms called a nor'easter. Do we have any East Coast students here who, like, you know, when we say a nor'easter, you know what a nor'easter is. It, it is a brutal, bitter, it comes out of the Arctic from the Northeast and slams into the East Coast, causing horrific destruction. I discovered that when I lived for 12 years on the East Coast. What is this? This is, this is a nor'easter? This is nasty. 
and this one was particularly nasty. Cape Cod already had over two feet of snow. Ice had knocked out over 4,000 phone lines and much of the electricity on the East Coast. And the Atlantic was churning waves that were churning in every direction at 60 and 70 feet high. The Pendleton was off the coast of Chatham, Massachusetts. This was a tanker that was 503 feet long. This is a big boat. 10,448 tons. Loaded on that tanker were 122,000 barrels of kerosene. Caught in this horrific nor'easter, the tanker broke in two with 33 surviving crew members now stranded on the remains of a sinking ship. That's when Bernie Weber, Irving Mask, Andrew Fitzgerald, and Richard Livesey boarded a 36-foot, not 503, 36-foot Coast Guard lifeboat on what many said was a suicide mission. When Bernie was told that he was supposed to lead this mission and pick four men, to, you know, three other guys to go with you, he couldn't, he couldn't name them because he knew it would, in all likelihood, they would go out. They might actually reach the remains of the ship, but the likelihood that they'd get back. And so he asked for three other volunteers, and it were these young guys that volunteered. In this picture, the, the pretty little boat on whichever side it is, because I'm backwards from you, is actually the, the boat that went out on the rescue that has been restored and is now being preserved to honor what happened that day. Not a very large vessel, is it? So they boarded the small lifeboat, headed into the Arctic winds, producing these 60, 70 foot waves blowing in every direction. But first they had to get over what was called the Chatham Bar. These are the shoals that in that area create even more violent, massive waves known to destroy vessels that were much um, larger than these, even in calmer seas. Bernie Weber, the 24-year-old leading this, this team of brave young men, was actually the son of a Baptist minister and said he felt God's hand guiding him and steering him through this storm. An excerpt from the book, Reverend Weber, had wanted his younger son to serve God as a minister. Bernie believed that he was serving God in the Coast Guard, and especially on this stormy night. Bernie later recalled the feeling, you receive the strength and courage, you know what your duty is, you realize that you have to attempt a rescue. It's born in you, it's part of your job. As the lifeboat pitched along a canyon of waves, Bernie and his crew spontaneously began to sing. They sang out of a combination of determination and fear through the snow and freezing sea spray. Their voices formed a harmony that rose over the howling winds. Weber could think of no more poignant hymn to fit the situation they found themselves in. And so they began to sing, Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee, let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed, be of sin the double cure, save from wrath and make me pure. Not the labor of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All of sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Naked come to thee I dress. Helpless look to thee for grace. Foul to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. They did make it over the bar, with all the windows being blown out of their little rescue boat, including the compass being washed off the boat. Of the 33 men left on the sinking tanker, 32 made it down what they called a Jacob's Ladder to jump onto the lifeboat in a raging sea. The way they did that, and if you watch the, the film, you can see how they maneuvered, because this tanker, what's left of the tanker is, is rocking. And if this little boat gets too close, it'll just get crushed. So the boat would pull back, and as it would pull in, the guys would jump on the boat, and they did it 33 times. There was one of the crew that missed and got crushed 
against the tanker, but 32 made it. So with the four, that made 36 men now on a 36-foot lifeboat, and they still had to make it back to the harbor in the same 60, 70-foot waves that they battled to get to the tanker. And they did. And this is still known as the most daring sea rescue in Coast Guard history. If you want, you can watch the nail biter of the movie called The Finest Hours. This is a commercial break. It's available on Amazon Prime or Disney Plus. Except what was interesting, if you see the movie version, when they're singing on the little boat, trying to get over the shoals, they're not singing a hymn, they're singing some popular song. And I'm thinking, man, if I'm in that kind of trouble, give me Rock of Ages. Um, I thought, little correction in the movie. After making the film, Casey Sherman said, this is about superheroes, except they don't wear capes and they don't wear tights. They wear hand-me-down foul weather gear and galoshes from World War II. And this brings me to another great story of navigating an impossible storm. This one is actually retold in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And we'll look at Mark's account in chapter 4. It's the familiar story of Christ calming the storm on the Sea of Galilee. Mark begins chapter 4 with Jesus teaching by the lake and telling a series of wonderful parables. But first, a bit about the Sea of Galilee. Here's a lovely picture in calm days. Also called the Lake of Gennesaret, the Sea of Tiberias, the Sea of Kinnereth, and sometimes just the lake. It's set in the hills of northern Israel, nearly 700 feet below sea level, eight miles wide, and from north to south, 12 miles long. And in some places, its greatest depth is about 200 feet. Because of its location, it's known to be uh, subject to really sudden, violent storms. So now we'll pick up in Mark's gospel, starting chapter 4, verses 35. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. And there were also other boats with him. And then Mark writes, a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him up and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, shh, quiet, be still. And then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? That even the winds and the waves obey him. I love Rembrandt's painting simply called Storm on the Sea of Galilee, painted way back in 1632. Interestingly, of all of Rembrandt's, Rembrandt's masterpieces, this is his only seascape that he painted. And if you look closely, you probably can't see it here, you have to Google, pull the picture up, but you can find it. If you look really closely, there are actually four men aboard the vessel. Of the, I mean, 14, not four, 14. And of these 14, it is said that Rembrandt included a self-portrait of himself in the little boat next to Jesus and his 12 disciples. Now, don't you wonder why he painted himself in the picture? Why did he choose to paint the story at all, given that it's the only seascape he ever painted? We can only speculate. Interesting, I find it, that he never painted the end of Mark's story when the sea's all calm and the winds have died down. But I did find another painting that's a little happier to look at by Stephen Gertson. He would painted it in 1949, a little more recent, and it is titled simply, Peace Be Still. Here's what I'd like to share with you from Mark's account of Jesus calming the storm. Only three things. I would encourage you to remember. So we'll go back to the storm. First, the disciples were not in the storm by accident. It was Jesus himself who said, let's go over to the other side. They were in the storm not because they messed up, 
They were not in the storm because they misunderstood Christ's direction. They were not in the storm because God was punishing them for some unknown sin or disobedience. Take note of this. They were in the storm because they had followed what Jesus said to do, where he said to go, in absolute obedience. Let that sink in for a moment. They were there by no accident. They were there out of obedience to the voice they followed. And I would remind you that if you are in a storm and you are there because you've been obedient and with all of your heart and with all of your strength, you are following hard after Christ and you don't understand what is now raging around you, that brings me to the second point. You're not in the storm alone because you see Jesus is in the boat and that makes all the difference. Imagine for a moment this disciple's sheer terror and shock that Jesus is actually sleeping in the middle of such a violent storm as waves crash over all of them and threaten to sink this little boat in the depths of the sea and take their lives. And Mark notes it's a furious squall. I'm imagining perhaps minus the, the ice and the freezing weather of a nor'easter, it might have been like what the tanker experienced when it split in half and a small crew went out to rescue them. So let's just be honest. Easy for us to say, yeah, where was their faith? Like they were walking with Jesus. They saw everything he did. What's wrong with those guys? But let's be honest. If we were in that boat... Wouldn't, be, wouldn't we be just as startled and aghast that Christ could be sleeping in the middle of that kind of a storm? I mean, have you ever been in a really rocking boat where you didn't know if you'd going to make it back to land? Or have you ever been on one of those flights where the seatbelt light comes on and suddenly if, that, if your seatbelt is not fast and your head's going to hit the top of the, of, <laughs> of the airplane and you actually look out the window and you see lightning going all around, you say, Dear God, get me down. No one sleeps through stuff like that, except Jesus. And the disciples wake him up with, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? So if we're really honest, in our worst storms and moments, we would not, I'm guessing, we would not quietly whisper with a little tap on the shoulder, Excuse me. Don't wish to deserve, disturb your well-deserved nap here. If it's not too much trouble, would you mind saving me? <laughs> no, like the disciples, we'd be shouting, wake up. How can you be sleeping at a time like this? Don't you care that we're about to drown here? And look at Mark's account. Jesus doesn't jolt awake with, oh my God, we're going to drown. Oh, wait a minute, I am God. He doesn't wake up with, how did I not know a squall was coming? Say your prayers, boys, we're going under. No. He gets up, he rebukes the wind, he speaks to the waves. Shh. Quiet. Be still. And it is suddenly completely calm. And then he says to his disciples, now you can, you, can, you can imagine how this was said. One way would be as a rebuke. Why are you so afraid? Somehow, as we look at his life and how he interacts and loves his disciples, I'm imagining it was more like, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And their response probably like ours would be at a time like that. They were terrified, and they asked each other, who is this? What kind of a teacher are we following that just his words and all of nature submits to his voice? Isn't that our response? when we get just a glimpse of who Christ really is, aren't we awestruck? Doesn't it leave us breathless, amazed, humbled? 
Which brings me to my third point. If Christ says to you, let's go there, Christ will get you to the other side. He'll calm the storm, he'll calm you, and remind you that even in the storms that threaten your life and dreams, he's got you. In this pandemic, he's got you. In this civil unrest, he's got you. In your struggle for justice and racial justice, he's got you. In your darkest hour, he's got you. At a graveside of a lost loved one, he's got you there too. All the way to your very last breath, he's got you. You see, there are times when Christ calms the storms, but we remember another story out at sea where Christ actually comes to the disciples now walking on the water, and when Peter sees him in his enthusiasm, he jumps up out of the boat and starts walking on the water until he realizes what he's done, and he begins to sink. Interestingly, in this account, Christ reaches out to him, picks him up, but he doesn't calm the storm until they get back in the boat. And we're reminded that sometimes he calms the storm, and sometimes he calms us as the storm rages. In either case, we are not alone, and we are safely in his hands. I'm also reminded that sometimes the rescue doesn't come as we expected or as we would choose. I talked earlier this semester about the two Dutch sisters, Betsy and Corrie ten Boom, whose story is told in The Hiding Place. The Dutch sisters who were in the concentration camp, Nazi concentration camp, Ravensbrück. God gave Betsy a vision that they would be free before the new year and that they would spend the rest of their lives telling the world that there's no pain so deep, but God isn't deeper still. It was a vision God had given her. She also said, Corey, we need to care for those who have been in concentration camps. And she had a vision of an exquisite, massive mansion and she described this place to Corey, and, and a place like this, where they can plant flowers and be surrounded with beauty so that their souls can heal from what they've experienced here. They hung on to that vision and that dream. And then Betsy died in the camp. And Corey was absolutely decimated. What happened? to the vision God gave. Why weren't we rescued? Why weren't we freed? And then it was on December 28th of that year, just before New Year, that Corey's name is called. And before the New Year, she walked out of Ravensbrook and did spend the rest of her life. Later, she learned that it was a clerical error. She wasn't supposed to be released. But as she walked out of that camp, she realized actually the vision was true. She and her sister were both free, just not the way she'd imagined. Betsy was free and fully alive in heaven, and Corey was free with a work to do. Now, what's interesting is she did go back to their home and, um, and, and ran into a, a woman who came into the clock shop. Um, the father, she and her father had repaired her clocks, and, and she was talking about her son had been in a prisoner of war camp and, and had not yet come home. She says, but I've been thinking about all of those that have been in prison camps and concentration camps, and they need a beautiful place where they can just rest and recover. And I, I, would, I, would, I want to give you my home so that that can be the place. And Corey described the home. Does it have pillars? Does it have this garden? Does it, she described the color. She said, it, and the woman was amazed, and she said, I don't remember. Were you ever at my house? Corey said, no. But my sister Betsy had a vision of your home, and it was exactly the home that Betsy described when she was in Ravensbrook. And that became the first place where Corey did ministry. 
I'll invite the worship team back up. So I think the question for us in whatever storm we are navigating is how do we respond? I recently downloaded, have been playing a, a worship song. It is not new. It's actually 10 years old. It came out in 2010. And, and I occasionally have little playlists that I create that I just hit replay on, and I just let it repeat and play and play again. One of the songs was When I Don't Know What to Do by Tommy Walker. I would like to offer that as our prayer this morning, but rather than using the first person when I don't know what to do, as a corporate prayer for us, I'm going to use the plural pronoun we and our. I'm going to invite you to stand. We will do a soft dismissal after this. Um, if you don't have to rush to class, I would invite you to just remain in a time of worship. Whether you want to sit or you want to come stand on one of these dots that says six feet and just spend some time on this day of remembrance in the middle of a pandemic, knowing that if you're following his voice, we're not where we are by accident. If you're in a boat that is churning and you don't know if you're going to make it to the other side, Jesus is in your boat. You can trust him to get you to the other side. So here is the prayer. Lord, we surrender all to your strong and faithful hand. In everything we will give thanks to you. We'll just trust your perfect plan. When we don't know what to do, we'll lift our hands. When we don't know what to say, we'll speak your praise. When we don't know where to go, we'll run to your throne. When we don't know what to think, we'll stand on your truth. When we don't know what to do, Lord, we surrender all. Though we'll never understand all the mysteries around us, we'll just trust your perfect plan. As we bow our knees, send your perfect peace. Send your perfect peace, Lord. As we lift our hands, let your healing come. Let your healing come to us. Lord, we surrender all to your strong and faithful hand. In everything, we will give thanks to you and will trust your perfect plan. Amen.